Hello, everyone. God bless you. Let me get situated here a little bit better. Okay, we have the relic of St. Catherine of Siena here. We ask for her intercession for this important theme uh, tonight. The gift of tears and a heart that is alive and a live heart. So we'll be speaking about tonight. And so as you follow along in the dialogue of St. Catherine, tonight the pages we're covering are roughly pages 150 to 175. It concludes the chapter on the bridge and then begins the chapter on tears, the gift of tears. And page 175 doesn't get us to the end of the chapter on tears. Um, but yeah, tonight I'm going to focus on tears. Maybe we'll pick some things up from the end of the bridge next month. But next month, basically, it'll be 175 to 200 for the reading. And that'll get us into uh, a new chapter as well on the truth. But tonight it's uh, 150 to 175, the chapter on tears, and especially as it has to do with the human heart, which St. Catherine opens up for us. So let's, I mean, I sh I, let me say this right away too. I am a little intimidated uh, by this theme, uh, the gift of tears and uh, the human heart uh, being made alive, that new heart that the Lord has won for us on Calvary. And uh, very much realize I'm a work in progress uh, in, in this way, in a real way. And the gift of tears, um, something strong in the Dominican charism, uh, but something I'm, I'm learning about and trying to enter into more. And so it's intimidating to open up this uh, topic here. But I guess I'm inviting you to uh, join me in learning about this and going deeper uh, in this. And yeah, Saint, reading St. Catherine this time around and thinking about it and some other insights, I think a uh, path has opened up. And so I wanna share that with you all as well. So yeah, in the coming days and weeks, you wanna let me know your thoughts on the gift of tears and any other insights you have. Uh, that I've missed, yeah, feel free to, to let me know, especially you lay Dominicans out there. Um, it is, yeah, something part of our charism, you know, so to think about together and think about what that looks like in our own lives. And I think St. Catherine of Siena brings us to the essence of it, um, and it can it can help us to, to see what it looks like in our own life, even if we're not um, ruining our I tear ducts, like Ignatius of Loyola did for weeping so much. Um, there's a deeper reality here uh, that we also we need to hear and we need to grow in. So let's uh, start with prayer. We'll turn first to our Blessed Mother, our Sorrowful Mother, right, who stood firm at the foot of the cross and had a heart that was alive and sensitive to human suffering a heart that even now is alive and sensitive to human suffering and human need, a mother's heart. So we are draw close to Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Lord, you call us on the way of salvation to also work for the salvation of others. You call us to have a heart for you, but also to have a heart for others, a heart that cries out for our brothers and sisters and their salvation, that cries out for our brothers and sisters and their growth and holiness, that cries out for our brothers and sisters in their need. And sorrows with those who sorrow and rejoices with those who rejoice. So, Lord, give us a heart that's alive, that's sensitive to these things. Give us a heart after the heart of your son, Jesus Christ, pierced out of love for us. 
We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask you, Lord, to guide this, this uh, talk tonight and guide our minds and hearts. St. Dominic, pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena, pray for us. St. Vincent Fair, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Martin de Porres, pray for us. St. Catherine de Ricci, pray for us. John Teller, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So the gift of tears, it is a rather important theme in early monasticism as well. There's a theme in early monasticism. You enter monastic life and you have a heart of stone. You have a heart that's dead. You have a heart that's not alive to the Lord. And a disordered heart and monastic discipline is about heart surgery. It's about getting your heart right before the Lord and uh, giving you a heart that's alive to the Lord and the things of God, alive with love. And so early monasticism, uh, there is this theme that, yeah, the, the hermits enter and there's a process of striving, rising from our sloth, and that there's often a breakthrough, a gift of tears, uh, new fervor, new vigor new compassion in the heart for the others after years of monastic uh, practice and prayer and penance and offering yourselves to God uh, for the sake of others too. And so there's a key theme in monasticism about compunction or penthos is the Greek word. Uh, the great um, Jesuit scholar, Irene Hashir, he wrote a great book on the Jesus prayer but also has a great book called Penthos that looks at this theme of compunction, contrition, and monasticism and shows it's not such a dour thing as you, you might think, uh, but it, it's mingled with joy and that it's about getting that new heart, opening ourselves to the Lord to form in us that new heart he's won for us on Calvary. And so the monastic tradition then with compunction has us going before the, the crucified Christ. Um, and, you know, contrition, uh, literally means like breaking, the breaking the heart, a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O oh Lord, you will not spurn. We pray at the end of Psalm 51. Compunction, too, um, literally is like a striking, a piercing. Uh, and so in our penitence, especially during the season of Lent, right, uh, we emphasize a little more compunction, contrition, and that's supposed to break our heart open, break our heart open to the new thing the Lord wants to do. Give up, break our hearts of stone to open ourselves to having hearts of flesh, as Ezekiel promises in chapter 36, and the promise of the new covenant and a new heart. So when the Dominicans come on the scene, and there's this emphasis on the gift of tears, they're just building on monasticism. As you know, uh, St. Dominic would pray John Cashin daily. He would read the conferences of John Cashin daily. St. Thomas Aquinas would read daily also the conferences of John Cashin. And John Cashin is that figure in the 300s who brings the, the wisdom from the East, from the Eastern hermits and desert fathers. He goes and talks to various Abbas out in the wilderness and the desert and brings back all that wisdom to the West and the conferences of John Cashin. So that was staple reading for a religious life. And for the Dominicans, they knew it by heart and they lived by it. They really tried to live this uh, monastic desert spirituality. And that involves compunction, contrition, a sort of a breakthrough where we do weep for our tears. We weep for offending God. We weep for uh, the pain in, in the world. We weep for sinners and the sorrow and the, the suffering that others go through as we unite ourselves to them and intercede for them. It's very much a participation in the intercession of Jesus. Consider Hebrews four or five. It speaks about uh, Jesus son, though he was learned obedience from what he suffered. And then uh, elsewhere in those chapters that in the days of his flesh, he offered prayer and supplication with loud groanings, and he was heard because of his reverence. 
right? So those, those groanings in prayer that Jesus experienced, that he let out, um, this, we should see the gift of tears, uh, this compunction and contrition of monasticism in that light. It's about the Lord Jesus drawing us into his own intercession with groanings and tears, and he was heard because of his reverence. So the, and as we come to the Dominicans, we see it is a key part of the Dominican charism. Right? Dominic was known for weeping for sinners through the nights. It marked his spirituality. Catherine of Siena, you know, the dialogue, a whole chapter on the gift of tears. And surely in her own life, it's illustrated. And we can think as, you know, sophisticated moderns uh, who know better, uh, we can say, okay, well, you know, that's the that's temperament, that's a medieval temperament, that's a, the temperament of this fiery Italian woman, St. Catherine of Siena, now that's the temperament, okay, you know, St. Dominic, uh, the Spaniard, um, you know, we can kind of go there, but to think about, okay, it's not just St. Catherine, it's not just St. Dominic, but even someone like St. Thomas Aquinas was known for shedding copious tears. Now, St. Thomas certainly didn't have a temperament that we normally associate with excessive weeping. Uh, he was an intellectual, very sober-minded, uh, very sober-minded and balanced, kind of middle of the road, phlegmatic. Uh, people categorize him phlegmatic when you think about the four temperaments. Um, but no, he too was, was known for his shedding of tears. So as Dominicans, uh, it should make us kind of scratch our heads. Better yet, scratch our hearts. What's going on in there? Uh, where is something like that in my life? Even up to a kind of a lesser degree, right? If something like that, and we'll get to the inner essence of it here shortly through St. Catherine. But if something that, if like that is entirely missing in my spirituality, I might be missing out on something something in the Dominican charism, something in the Christian tradition, something that the Lord wants to bring about, maybe even this Lent. And so to open ourselves uh, to this, I know of several Dominican friars who are in some conversation over this theme, and that um, several Dominican friars feel that us contemporary Dominicans, uh, it is something lacking in our spirituality. It is something we could use more of. Right. And a lot of us Dominicans, you know, we could tend to be intellectuals, kind of stand at a distance from things, kind of take the high view, kind of a sophisticated view. Um, but are we weeping with sinners? Are we crying out for the salvation of souls? Are we being brought to our knees as we plead with the Lord uh, for sinners like St. Dominic did, for the salvation of the world, for truth to, to reign in people's hearts? Is our prayer life filled with that kind of fire and fervor. I would certainly like more of that in my life. And so I'm open to, to listening. I'm open to try and to, to grow in this. And that, um, yeah, it could be something transformative in our own time. Just another sign of this, I know I've heard of um, at Providence College, there's a Nashville Dominican sister who's working on her master's and she's writing her master's dissertation on the gift of tears in the Dominican tradition. So I don't know her personally, but evidently from her choice of that thesis theme, it's on her heart too. And wondering too, if that's something that needs to kind of be a little more focused, emphasized in our own uh, life, in our own uh, life today as Dominicans. Furthermore, I know of someone who's, who's praying and offering sacrifices for Dominicans of our day. Uh, to recover this gift of tears, this charism, that's uh, this you know, part of our Dominican charism. And so, um, yeah, it's worth thinking about and kind of doing a self-examination in our, in our own lives on, um, yeah, if we are a little too cold, if our hearts are not really alive enough to the sufferings of others. And the stakes, the high stakes of this life, and the eternal salvation or da damnation of souls, and souls are at stake. Are we uh, uh, alive to that reality? Or are we kind of aloof, nonchalant about everything? You know, there was um, a custom in monastic life 
uh, this kind of looking back and injunction against like laughter. Now we kind of look at that today and say, oh, those dour monks. Um, and you know, certainly there is a place for laughter in life. But St. Benedict's 10th rule of humility, for instance, talks about uh, not giving into to laughter or not to kind of um, um, going excessive with it. Then the 10th step of humility is that we are not given to ready laughter. For it is written, only fools raise their voices in laughter. So what I want to, to do is not think of, so not to, I mean, there is a place for laughter that we can kind of tend to then to dismiss this entirely from the monastic tradition. But I think what the monastic tradition is pointing to is sort of this flippant attitude of soul, right? Kind of a, a flippant gaze upon the world. You kind of just look at everything and like make jokes about things, kind of nonchalant, um, flippantly, you know, making jokes about things. And okay, you know, jokes here and there are, are fine, but if you begin to see all of reality as just something to kind of poke fun at, uh, you end up with a very kind of superficial gaze. And if you brush everything off with a humorous remark, you're, you're left with kind of a, a light superficiality. And so this frivolous laughter that can kind of pervade your whole mentality uh, you find everything in life kind of amusing. Uh, you kind of dismissive. You you're dismissive of things and keep it at a distance, kind of through um, humor in a way. I think that's what the monastic tradition is on the guard against. And I did notice that when I was um, a Carthusian for those six years, that uh, I I did I kind of felt like I knew what the monastic tradition was was getting at. Yeah, there are ways in which kind of just everything becomes kind of a lighthearted um, kind of um, joke or kind of amusement. Um, you kind of poke fun at everything of just in your mind. And it, it does kind of block you from a, something deeper. It leaves you on a superficial level. Frivolous laughter, joking about everything. Uh, it, it leaves you with a superficial gaze upon the world and the needs of other people don't strike your heart then, because you deflect it, you dismiss it with a little joke. And so uh, the real issues that are important, that are significant, you kind of brush off with laughter. And yeah, there can be certain cultures that, uh, even in religious life, that um, can kind of revel in that. And so it is a great wisdom for the monastic tradition to not give into that. You know, yeah, it's fine to joke, and that should be part of life. It keeps things, you know, light and joyful. Uh, but if that begins to pervade all of your conversation and per begins to pervade how you see the world, you're going to be left with a shallow heart. And we want deep hearts, hearts uh, open to the depths of God, open and alive uh, to the Lord and His purposes, and to great love and compassion for others, weeping for the salvation of souls. I just want to share St. Dominic, how this shows up in his own life. I should have mentioned earlier, too, that questions or comments that come up uh, as I'm speaking, feel free to put that in the comment box on YouTube, and then um, they'll be sent to me at the end, and then we'll get into some question and answer, more discussion type thing, things. So, yeah, let's, let's look at St. Dominic, right? You know, St. Catherine of Siena. She um, obviously, you know, joined the Dominicans. She's very much shaped by St. Dominic. Um, you know, says amazing things about St. Dominic. And so let's see how um, this shows out in the master's life himself, our Holy Father, St. Dominic. I changed the title a little bit for tonight. Uh, Gift of Tears in a Fire was the original one. Um, because anyway, I didn't have my copy of my dialogue with me. Uh, for about a week. Anyways, so but once I got into it, I thought what I really want to talk about is the gift of tears and uh, an alive heart, a heart that's alive, because uh, they're they're very much related in St. Catherine's thinking. I, I think it gets us to the core of the matter. So this, you know, I'm just going to go quickly through this, but this is from Jordan of Saxony's Libellus his short kind of biography of St. Dominic and the beginnings of the order. 
Still contemporary St. Dominic, so that's the earliest biographical information we have of St. Dominic. So about St. Dominic, he says, he prayed without ceasing and making use of the leisure afforded for contemplation. He scarcely ever left the monastery grounds. God gave him the singular gift of weeping for sinners, the wretched and the afflicted, whose sufferings he felt within his compassionate heart, which poured out its hidden fillings in a shower of tears. Yeah, so St. Dominic's heart was compassionate. You know, St. Bruno the Carthusian in one of the funeral scrolls, so as he died, they passed around a scroll and people could write remembrances of St. Bruno. And one of the remembrance of St. Bruno was he was a man who understood the human heart. A man who understood the human heart. Right, That's where deep contemplative prayer, silence, um, brings us compassion, brings us uh, to understand the human heart. And that was St. Dominic as well. Now, this next passage, I do want to show the cheerfulness of St. Dominic as well. So it's important to embrace the whole paradox here. St. Dominic wept for sinners and was serious about that, and yet was very joyful, filled with joy and cheerfulness. So we don't want to become dour saints. Like our, our famous Father Bill Holt says, you know, God deliver us from dour saints, from, you know, saints who are, are sad, from, uh, we want happy saints. And yeah, saints are blessed, they're happy. So St. Uh, Dominic captured that paradox. His mind always retained its usual calm, unless he was stirred by compassion and mercy. And because a joyful heart begets a cheerful face, he manifested the peaceful harmony within his soul by his cordial manner and his pleasant countenance. This cheerfulness is what enabled him so easily to, to win everyone's affection. Right, that's been kind of Pope Francis's point in uh, Evangelium Gaudium, Joy of the Gospel. You know, to be effective ministers of the gospel, um, we need to be joyful. Uh, and that joy is contagious. But we also need compassionate hearts, right? In the midst of that. This cheerfulness is what enabled him to so easily win everyone's affection, for as soon as they looked at him, they were captivated. At all times, his words and his works proclaimed him a man of the gospel, Vir Evangelicus. During the day, none was more affable, none more pleasant to his brethren or associates. At night, none was more constant in prayer or watching. In the evening, tears found a place with him, and in the morning, gladness. The daytime he shared with his neighbor, but the night he dedicated to God. For he knew that in the daytime, God has commanded his mercy in a canticle to him in the night. He wept frequently. Indeed, his tears were his bread day and night. In the day, he shed tears during his mass and at night during his untiring vigils. Just one more passage about St. Dominic from Jordan of Saxony. Just to show how this gift of tears, it's linked to yearning for the salvation of souls. St. Catherine of Siena and her chapter on tears brings that out early on in her treatment. That it's, it's united to crying out for the salvation of souls. So I love this passage about St. Dominic, how he did that. It was his custom to spend his night watches in prayer and having shut the door to pray to the Father in secret. All right, so for the early Dominicans, uh, that's the phrase they use for what we call mental prayer or private prayer or personal prayer. The early Dominicans love to use the phrase uh, secret prayer, prayer in secret. And they take it from the words of Jesus, close the door and pray to your Father in secret. But that's the word that, that captured this more free, spontaneous, personal prayer, what we call mental prayer. And uh, calling it secret prayer shows how interior it is. But it also shows that the body can be involved. Think of St. Dominic's nine ways of prayer. He did that in secret as well. And so it wasn't just a mental thing. You know, that's the unfortunate thing about mental prayer. It can become just like a mental thing. And so secret prayer kind of helps us avoid that um, error. Uh, but yeah, the body can be involved in secret prayer. And so already here in the Libellus of Jordan of Saxony, we, we have this phrase, 
and the early Dominicans run with it. At times during his prayer, he betrayed the feelings of his heart with groans and sounds which could not be stifled and could be heard from a distance. His frequent and special prayer to God was for the gift of true charity, capable of laboring for and procuring the salvation of men. Since he deemed that he would be a true member of Christ only when he could devote himself entirely to winning souls, like the Lord Jesus, the Savior of all men, who offered himself completely for our salvation. Right, it's nice. You know, we see here uh, Dominic as a young man. He's praying for the charity to be able to do this. We can kind of take that for granted. We can kind of think that, okay, I'll strive to work and desire the salvation of souls, but to kind of think we can do it by our own efforts. No, it's the grace of God that we have to plead with him for, that we have to ask. Lord, give me the charity to be able to offer myself as a complete and living sacrifice. It doesn't count the cost. That does it in season and out of season. That does it throughout the day through the high points, through the low points. We need that grace of charity to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We need to ask for it. Ask, seek, knock. And when we ask, seek, and knock for things unto our salvation, uh, for the good of souls, for the glory of God, we're praying in Jesus' name, and it's a prayer that's infallibly answered. The Lord's faithful. When we pray for the right things, he's faithful. So to pray for things we might take for granted. Uh, like for the charity to offer ourselves completely as a living sacrifice for the salvation of souls. St. Dominic prayed that a lot as a young man, as this passage uh, suggests. And the Lord heard his prayer and answered him. And he was kept humble when he received it because he saw it was a gift from God. And he had cried out for it so much. So at times his prayer betrayed the feelings of his heart with groans and sounds which could not be stifled. Just I wanted to give you the Hebrews passage. So it's it's passage five, chapter five, verse seven through 10. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, right? So that's the first, that's the origin of the gift of tears in a way, Jesus himself. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the eternal salvation, the source of eternal salvation for all who believe in him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that's Jesus, and that's St. Dominic living that out in his life. Okay. And we'll see a little later in St. Catherine of Siena, she talks about who is it that weeps, you know, when we weep, when we cry out for sinners, uh, she notes it's the Holy Spirit weeping through us. And then she cites that verse from Romans 8, the Holy Spirit uh, prays in us with groaning, right, beyond all expression. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So that's St. Dominic, source of our charism. St. Catherine lives that out well. And to seek their intercession for this as well. St. Dominic, so I'll just ask him right now for all of us. St. Dominic, St. Catherine, St. Vincent, St. Thomas, St. Martin de Porres. Pray for us that we might have this gift, this gift of spend, this gift of charity by which we spend, spend ourselves for the sake of the salvation of souls, where we offer ourselves in secret and through our efforts, through our prayers, through our sacrifices, through our good works, for the sake of the salvation of souls, helping people grow in holiness, and help us, our founders, our great saints, to know what that's going to look like in each one of our lives, to know how to move forward with it. We can't do it without your intercession, without God's grace, so take us by the hand and help us with this. And they can help us. There's a story in St. Catherine's life that I really love, and I hope she repeats for us. She was visited one time by a Franciscan. Uh, so, okay, you know, already kind of the, the story set. <laughs> a Franciscan scholar visits St. Catherine, and uh, he's skeptical of St. Catherine. And he's a great scripture scholar. He's known for his profound classes. 
And um, okay, we know the stage is set, kind of this overly intellectual Franciscan coming to see a St. Catherine and kind of wanting to kind of prove her wrong or kind of prove her a fraud or people are making too much of her. And then so um, he goes to St. Catherine and, you know, he's, he's become a little lax uh, as a Franciscan, certainly not in line with kind of Franciscan poverty and simplicity. Uh, he's a great professor, though. So he comes to St. Catherine, kind of is going to judge her a little bit. Um, and so uh, he comes and he kind of puts on the, the face of humility. You know, oh, great St. Catherine, I've, I've come to learn about the scriptures from you. And then uh, St. Catherine immediately throws herself at his feet and says, no, 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 you are the teacher. You are the professor. You need to teach me about the scriptures. You need to teach me about the scriptures. Um, so they go back and forth a, a little, you know, back and forth for a while. And um, the Franciscan, he's like, okay, I'm not, I can't like catch her in anything. And I can't prove her entirely wrong. Okay, maybe she's not a fraud, but you know, good people are making too much of her. You know, she's just an ordinary uh, devout uh, woman. And then, so as he's leaving, um, Saint Catherine, you know, grabs him uh, by his feet and says, you know, please, please, please pray for me. Pray for me, uh, a poor sinner. Um, and then the Franciscan, kind of just as a natural response, says, oh, oh. You pray for me, please pray for me. Um, he's kind of you know embarrassed, and so but you know pray for me. Um, and then so and then she says, I will, I will. So the Franciscan leaves, and he thinks, okay, okay, maybe she's not a fraud, but okay, certainly it's overblown. She's not as holy as everyone says. So uh, that night, the Franciscan uh, wakes up. This great intellectual wakes up, and um, he begins to pray a little bit, and then. Out of nowhere, he just starts weeping. <laughs> he just starts weeping. He doesn't know where it's coming from. Um, he's like, okay, what's what's happening here? Okay, so he you know, does some prayers, goes back to bed. He wakes up in the morning, uh, begins to prepare for class. You know, reading his lectures, very sophisticated, eloquent. Uh, these lectures, uh, he starts to prepare for class, and again, he starts weeping. He starts weeping, and he's kind of like, what's happening here? You know, I, did I not get enough sleep last night? What's happening here? Um, and then it's getting closer to class. And again, um, he, he starts weeping. I'm like, where is this coming from? And he says to himself, did my mother die or something? Like, what's, what's happening here? <laughs> uh, did I drink too much last night? He asks himself. <laughs> he really does. That's, that's in the record. Did I drink too much? What's happening here? Like, where is this coming from? And then it's like, I have to get myself ready for class. I have to get up there. Podium. So again, he's lecturing. And again, out of nowhere, he starts weeping. Um, and then class ends and he has a little downtime. And then finally it occurs to him. St. Cat, you know, that woman, St. Catherine, prayed for me. <laughs> she prayed for me. Uh, and she won for him the gift of tears. St. Catherine's intercession uh, brought this kind of haughty intellectual to his knees, brought him back to the, the fervor uh, that he began with as a Franciscan. And you know he sold all these possessions, uh, embraced poverty in a new profound way, and lived a very fervent uh, Franciscan uh, religious life for the rest of his life. So we ask you know Saint Catherine to do the same for us. When that um, gift of yearning, longing, that gift of tears for us, um, and yeah, we, we entrust ourselves to her, and she's done it before. She can do it again. So we see when we turn to the dialogue, uh, this chapter on tears, and her treatment of tears actually be begins a couple pages before the beginning um, of this chapter entitled Tears. Right, so if you open up your copy of the dialogue, it's really on page 159 with section 86 that she begins uh, talking about tears. Um, and uh, God the Father first speaks to her. And we, we see, first of all, the context of the salvation of souls. This is where this gift comes in, especially, and what it's about. God the Father says to her, I have told you all this to make you shake up the fire of your holy longing and compassion. So the Lord tells her about what's happening in the church, how uh, there's so much need, 
how people are falling away. And uh, God says, I told you all this, and I've told you about my plan of salvation, the bridge, and all the particularities about that. I have told you all this to make you shake up the fire of your holy longing and your compassion and grief over the damnation of souls. Right, so the gift of tears are going to be about those things, fear of, or I'm sorry, fire of your holy longing, compassion, grief over the damnation of souls. And then God says, I want your sorrow and love to drive you to pressure me with sweat and tears, tears of constant humble prayer offered to me in the flames of burning desire. And not just for yourself, but for so many others of my creatures and servants who will hear you and be compelled by my love to beg and pressure me to be merciful to the world and to the mystic body of Holy Church. Never, and then a little further down, uh, next paragraph, two paragraphs, never cease offering me the incense of fragrant prayers for that salvation of souls. I want to be merciful to the world. With your prayers and sweat and tears, I will wash the face of my holy bride. So there's a nice trio that comes here. And actually, I have a slide about this. I shouldn't have put this up uh, originally. There's a nice um, triad here. Okay. And the triad is tears, is prayer, tears, and sweat. Prayer, tears, and sweat. Yeah, I'm sorry, here it is. <clears throat> and God will wash the face of his bride with our prayer, sweat, and tears. So we see that this triad, that the three are connected, and it's all about compassion. It's all about burning desire. It's all about pleading for the good of others, the salvation of souls. You know, we, when we hear this phrase, salvation of souls, we want to hear that in the broadest sense. We don't want to just hear it as uh, simply saving people from damnation. Or that, you know, that's enough in itself, of course. Um, that a transition from being outside the state of grace, being brought into the state of grace, saving your soul, that's huge. That's a key part of it. But to also hear in salvation of souls, like our work for the holiness of others, all our preaching and teaching all our efforts at helping people to grow in holiness through Bible studies, through our words, through our prayers for them. So we want to hear salvation of souls in the broadest sense. I sometimes would just use the word, the good of souls, and that captures it as well. You know, whatever pertains to the good of souls, to give yourselves totally to that. And it's through our prayer, sweat, and tears. So I like that the word sweat is thrown in there as well. Our labors, our efforts, you know, all that's contained under that word sweat. The day-to-day -day grind of doing your work for the salvation of souls, different ways that the Lord is calling you to that. That's part of this offering. Your prayers, your sweat, and your tears. And the Lord will wash the face of his bride, Holy Church, uh, with these offerings of ours. And we see the, the key theme here about the, the flames of burning desire. And in a way, you know, this theme of the fire of burning desire links in this theme of the gift of tears to that larger theme we find at St. Catherine about desire, right? We've seen that again, time and time again, that um, St. Catherine is all about desire, having our desire stirred up. You know, holy desire is about charity. Charity involves this holy desire. And so tears are basically intense holy desire, a fire of longing coming from charity. And sometimes that shows itself in literal tears. Sometimes that fire just burns within. And that's, you know, where there can be differences of temperament. You know, women tend to weep more than, than men. That's just, just a fact, just the way that we're built. I would... <laughs> I mean, I've been uh, growing in my awareness of this. Um, I mean, yeah, so I asked, um, so the, uh, the devout woman who I don't, wouldn't think of like as a very emotional woman, but it came out in conversation. Um, and I'm like, well, I mean, how often do you think you weep? There's what I asked at some point. It, it was, there was a context to it. And then she was like, oh yeah, at least weekly. 
I was like, at least weekly, really? Um, and so uh, there is something about women, it, it comes more naturally, um, just the way you're, you're hardwired. Um, and that's nice, that's good. Um, and so um, then it's also gonna be temperaments. But yeah, the inner core of it is that, that burning desire. And we'll, we'll see St. Catherine talk about that um, more explicitly. Um, but um, yeah, tears, it's very much related to the heart. So we, we see that come up in St. Catherine as she talks about um, the gift of tears. It's related to desire, it's related to the heart, right? Someone without desire doesn't shed tears. Someone who has a, kind of a dry, dead heart um, doesn't, well, maybe they, it's, okay. Well, I mean, St. Catherine, she, she does talk, I mean, everyone sheds tears, even a worldly people, people who are not in the state of grace can shed tears as well. So we'll see in St. Catherine five stages of the gift of tears, or I'm sorry, five stages of tears. And the first level of tears that she treats are worldly people. Uh, worldly people, right? I mean, worldly people weep too, you know? They're in a immoral, adulterous love relationship. And that relationship ends. And these lovers are weeping over that loss. And so yeah, they can be weeping copiously, but it's disordered weeping. It's, it's weeping based on uh, sin, life of sin. You know, so just tears, cross tears are not salvific in themselves. You know, the, the man who's trying to gain a million, or I'm sorry, <laughs> who's trying to gain like a hundred million uh, and fails at that can weep. You know, someone loses everything in the stock market, someone who's a, a miserly person, that weeping can come from that and they're not, it's not necessarily salvific. You know, there, there's, um, as St. Paul puts it, you know, a godly, there's a sorrow that leads to death but also a godly sorrow that can lead to life. So St. Catherine has an account of that as well. But overall, right, you know, tears, tears reflect uh, desire and tears reflect what's happening in the heart. So tears are a sign that's a heart of, uh, that the heart is alive, that something is going on in the heart. Um, so, you know, you can weep for ungodly things. Things don't turn out as you want. There can be tears of self-pity. And so, uh, you know, a question we can ask about the gift of tears is not just how much you weep, but, you know, what are you weeping for? I know a, a devout woman who she's, she struggles with depression and she sees a therapist. And sometimes her therapist will ask her, you know, as, as they start, you know, their monthly meeting or whatever, uh, the, the therapist will ask, well, how much have you been crying this past week? And the therapist, you know, kind of judges how uh, intense the depression has been this past week. And I think, okay, that's, a, that's an okay question, you know, to start with. But the question that, uh, the follow-up question that I would be interested in asking and that I did ask is, okay, not just how much are you weeping, but what are you weeping for? What are you weeping for? Are your tears coming from a place of self-pity, right? What are you weeping over? Are they coming over kind of frustration, tears of a lost opportunity, tears of loneliness? Are they tears focused on yourself? Or are they tears focused on others? Are you weeping because they're suffering in the world? Are you weeping because people are headed to hell? Are you weeping because Holy Mother Church uh, is struggling and needs her, her face washed, needs renewal. So it's not just how much you're weeping, it's a what are you weeping for? So that, that's a key question. Uh, to put it another way, what is your heart moved by? What moves your heart? What do you grieve by? So all of these are good questions uh, to kind of call to mind. But yeah, tears are basically the, a sign of what's happening in the heart. So God says to St. Catherine, Dialogue 89, I want you to know that all tears come from the heart. And he says a little bit later, tears well up from the fountain of the heart. 
So tears flow from the heart and they express the condition of the heart. What you weep over helps you to see where your heart is, what's important to your heart. Or what you weep over or what you, your heart is moved by, what you're grieved by, what you're disturbed by, reflects what your heart is set on. And how well you're moved, how sensitive you are, how, how um, are you moved by anything or not? And that too shows the state of your heart. So the underlying core reality about tears uh, is this state of the heart. And so St. Catherine, as she speaks about tears, gives us a very important term, uh, the tears of fire. And she notes, uh, you can see the passage here in the second paragraph on this slide, uh, tears of fire, they're shed without physical weeping. Maybe towards the end of our class tonight lecture, I'll, I'll give a, a few paragraphs from St. Catherine on this uh, tears of fire to see what she says about it. And basically the tears of fire is that underlying reality. And then the underlying reality of intense desire, the fire charity burning in your heart, longing, crying out uh, for the salvation of souls, that underlying reality can be there and alive and well without physical tears. So in this later passage, yeah, so it's Dialogue 91 and 92, where she gives a long account of the tears of fire. So you want to spend some time with that. There she says, there is a weeping of fire, of true holy longing, and it consumes in love. And she says, you know, sometimes we really yearn for the physical tears. It can be kind of nice to, <laughs> to weep sometimes, and we can feel uh, especially pious. Right, if we weep during our devotions during the way of the cross, we can feel especially pious, so we can kind of want that sometimes. Um, but sometimes this is not for our good, it can kind of puff us up, or the Lord wants to do something deeper. Um, so instead, I give her spiritual tears, tears of the heart, full of the fire of, of my divine charity, God says. So the Lord knows best what we need. Yeah, here we have a beautiful, or I don't know, I mean, it's, I don't know if beautiful is the right word, but yeah, John Paul II, um, his heart moved. I don't know the context of that, but um, yeah, imagine, you know, we catch a glimpse of probably what happened a lot in his chapel, his private chapel. St. John of the Cross, like St. I'm sorry, St. John Paul II, like St. Um, Dominic, like Jesus, crying out with loud tears and groanings, a man of prayer, a man of intercession, a man of the heart, right? A man of the heart. So uh, tears are about the heart. They kind of give us an insight into the heart. And someone who has a heart uh, that's alive um, weeps or their hearts move. Uh, think about Mother Teresa Calcutta. So this is, uh, this is from a picture. Um, I was visiting somebody's house and I won't tell who the family is. So I, I've just, I've cropped the picture here. So Mother Teresa in this picture, she's actually surrounded by a family on each side. And so uh, this family, it's the mother and the father, and the mother's holding about a three-year-old son, a four-year-old son, and the father's holding a, like a three-year-old daughter, and they're surrounding Mother Teresa. And the mother was, um, used to be a missionary of charity. Uh, she knew Mother Teresa well in India and was uh, in formation, the missionaries of charity. But then before vows, you know, she left, she you know, felt called to marriage, and then, you know, have this family and then so she's going back to visit mother Teresa of calcutta with her family and um so imagine that this family comes from the you know from america to calcutta to visit you they come across the ocean and they're going to take a picture like you're going to try to put on the best face possible as you can you're going to try to put on a big smile <laughs> uh, and so you well uh, but here you see like uh, the best face that mother Teresa can put on and you see the longing in her eyes. You, you see the, the depth of sorrow and longing and um, a deep heart as expressed in those eyes. Mother Teresa, who says, the longing for God is terribly painful, 
and yet the darkness is becoming greater. What contradiction there is in my soul. So this, this painful longing, this deep heart uh, is an expression of this, this gift of tears, even if she's not shedding literal tears or not. But this deep longing is what gives us deep hearts. And so in those, you know, this is not a frivolous person. This is not someone who's falling into that frivolous laughter that monasticism was kind of skeptical of. This is a, a woman, Mother Teresa, who had great joy, but also could enter into sorrow with others and mourn for others and intercede for others. Um, so yeah, those, those deep eyes. Okay. So this is um, so this is from Saint Catherine. And basically, I'm taking um, her introduction. So that first section in the Gift of Tears, page 161, section 88, she lays out five stages of tears. And basically, and so that's dialogue 88, and then dialogue 90, she comes back to those same five. And so I just bring in some fra phrases from the, the second treatment of it as well. Just bring them together here. So you're, you're getting here both 88 and 90. Um, and I know it's all kind of crammed in there. Um, okay, so first of all, there, there are the tears of damnation, the tears of this world's evil ones. The first kind of tears, the tears of those who are dead in sin, come from a heart that is corrupt. Right? You know, like the... <laughs> The high school student uh, who's a you know said love and her boyfriend breaks up with her. Uh, you say it's an ungodly relationship. Um, there's that attachment, and there are just loads of tears, copious tears that are shed. Are they salvific tears? Maybe they can be, uh, but they they need not be. And so this is the first uh, stage of tears. Those those of those those of worldly people. Uh, but then the second level of tears, there are tears of fear, fear of punishment, of those who weep for fear because they have risen up from sin out of the fear of punishment. The second kind of weeping is that of souls who are beginning to know their own sinfulness through the punishment that must be their lot after sin. Right, you know, so as we speak about contrition, this would be that imperfect contrition. You sorrow because of fear of hell or something or fear of punishment or um, you weep uh, because of the, the pain uh, that um, kind of a, your sin brings you into, okay? And then a third level of sin, I'm gonna start third level of tears, third stage, are those who have risen up from sin and are beginning to taste me. These weep tenderly and begin to serve me, but because their love is imperfect, so is their weeping. They taste my divine mercy and receive from me many gifts and consolations. This weeping is still imperfect because it's mixed with weeping that is spiritually sensual. And she says um, that in this third stage, people can weep a lot from kind of self-pity. Or there are times where their heart is moved, let's say, and you know, praying the stations of the cross, and then they they weep tears. But then they're out among their neighbors and they're kind of show a cold indifference at times to other people. That's still an imperfect state of the hearts. You know, there's movement of the Lord, the heart's beginning to be moved in this third stage, yet it's still imperfect. A lot of selfishness still wrapped into it. A lot of spiritual centrality, you know, seeking spiritual consolation. And when you don't have that, you're kind of left with nothing. So that's the third stage, you know, it's starting to happen. And then she, she jumps rather quickly then to, you know, to the fourth stage then is perfect. You know, so the third stage is kind of that imperfect stage of love. The fourth stage is perfect. Uh, so the fourth stage is that of souls who have attained perfection in loving their neighbors and love me, God, without any self-interest. These weep and their weeping is perfect. Um, and basically it's perfect because they're weeping for uh, over the offense that God suffers. Or their heart is moved that God is not loved as he should be. Their heart is moved that people don't visit him in the tabernacle. Their heart is moved that love himself is not loved. 
Uh, so the offense that God suffers, uh, that moves their hearts. That's this fourth stage, perfect love, perfect tears. Uh, and then also for their neighbor. Uh, they weep more over their neighbor than themselves. Um, the suffering the neighbor goes through. Um, the possibility of the neighbor of being damned and trying to save that person, longing for that person's salvation. So it's more about the other than oneself in this perfect stage of tears, more about the divine other, God, or more about the human other, our neighbor, than ourself, in this fourth level, this perfect level of tears. So she says, uh, but if these souls in the third stage of tears, imperfect love, exercise themselves in virtue, constantly, right, consistency of life and virtue, they reach the fourth stage, where because their desire has grown, again, she brings up desire, they so unite themselves with my will that they can no longer desire anything but what I will. They are clothed with a charity for their neighbors that gives birth in them to a lover's lament that I am offended and their neighbors hurt. And then she talks about a fifth stage, and she, she says rather frequently that these two uh, can be united, these two stages, the fourth and fifth. Um, the fifth is like another aspect of it. The fifth stage is that of sweet tears shed with great tenderness. Such weeping, the fourth stage is one with the fifth sort, that of ultimate perfection. Here the soul is united with truth and the flame of holy desire burns more fiercely within her. She has a beautiful paragraph on unitive tears. Uh, that gets at that um, unitive tears, so the state of union and tears that flow from that. Uh, so that's on page 163, the second last full paragraph. Uh, it's it's part of oh my, I mean, some of these sections are so long, it's hard to identify things. Um, section 89. Anyways, um, but tears of consolation from deep graces and prayer. And she'll talk about how four and five can be joined. And she'll, she'll talk about how, I don't think I had a time to make a slide out of this, um, but on the top of page 164, she talks about how the two can be combined. Great joy in our union with God, kind of stage five, and tears can flow from that great joy and union with God. That can be joined with sorrow over our neighbor, sorrow over our neighbor's suffering. So she says that this great paradox can exist. You're experiencing happiness in God, uh, but you're also at sorrowing for the sake of your neighbor and what's happening in the church and in the world. And that the, the two can be united, uh, this happiness in God and yet this, this sorrow for others, right? Because they're, they're two faces of love, a love that yearns for the salvation, the good of our neighbor, the good of the church, the good of the world. Uh, and longing for that, pleading for that, weeping for that, united also with the happiness, being united to God. So the fourth stage united to the fifth stage. And she has some things about that, which is helpful. Top of page 164. Um, okay. So what I want to talk about now is we have. Okay. So I think we, we have a good sketch there of what's, and I, I'm looking at the time. Um, so <laughs> uh, 15 minutes, I hope. I hope I can do the, the rest here in 15 minutes. Um, so what I want to think about now, and this is kind of my own kind of personal journey with this, and thinking about this and some kind of insights that I recently um, have discovered with the help of others, you know, talking to some other Dominican friars about it, bouncing off some ideas and what, you know, how the Lord is working in our hearts and in our prayer life. Um, you know, for like I committed with another Dominican friar to kind of join together this Lent and praying for kind of a new gift here gift of tears, you know, whether it's, you know, always shows itself in literal tears, but, um, but also the tears of fire. And yeah, that's what we're, we're more interested in, right? In that inner reality, the core of it. Uh, and that's what St. Catherine holds up as primary. And so I'll, I'll end with her kind of long section on um, the tears of fire. Um, 
And so, but yeah, to, to have that, it's going to be a grace. So we're united. I mean, we're just, it's a small thing we're doing together, but just praying on Psalm 51 uh, daily and, you know, spending time with Psalm 51, meditating on it uh, as uh, you're bringing about that contrition of hearts. You know, Lord, bring us, a, a, give us a contrite heart, a heart that's broken and humble, uh, a heart that is moved um, more and more uh, in tune with God's heart. So we're united together and praying one, with, with one another, or for one another in this regard, and uh, committed to the, this practice. And so, you know, we're talking about these things as well. And so, yeah, the Lord has kind of been moving, at least in kind of opening up the way. Uh, and it's not, you know, totally new, of course, but um, just kind of some more precision and thinking through this. So I think um, the word of God is going to be important here. Right. It's it's through taking in. So the in the word of God, like the Psalm 51, we're presented with like a certain interior disposition. A certain movement of the soul. And by praying that psalm over and over again, that interior disposition of the of the psalmist, that inspired, anointed interior disposition of the psalmist um, is brought into our own disposition, interior disposition. We're shaped by it. The Psalms shape our hearts. And so to, to take in the inspired word of God, right? The inspired word of God is transformative. It's living and effective. That's why we have these long passages from Isaiah 40 to 66. These long passages from Jeremiah, you know, the Lamentations, those five chapters where you're, they're weeping. Jeremiah's weeping for Jerusalem and the holy city. And we read those chapters over and over of lamentations and our hearts begin to weep more and more for the church, the new Jerusalem. And there are resonances as we pray through those five chapters of lamentations that we see, oh yeah, this is like the church. They, they devour their young. It's in our world today. You know, so there's a phrase in the lamentations, even the women, you are devouring the young. And we think, yeah, abortion, abortion. In our own time, that's what this looks like in the world today, in the world today. And yeah, it's so tragic. And to, to kind of enter into that inspired word of God, lamentations, that enti inspired disposition. And the Lord will use the word of God to bring us, to give us these gifts, to give us the heart he wants us to have. So our hearts need to be broken and contrite, and they need to be reformed by the word of God, to think the thoughts of God to have the heart that God has towards these issues. And so to really lean on the word of God to help accomplish that, that I'm convinced that's, that's the way forward, at least in my own life. And another big key thing here is going to be uh, Jesus crucified, right? How do we enter into the heart that God wants for us? By beholding his pierced heart, right? And this is so Dominican, coming before the crucified Christ. All those fra angelical paintings where Dominic is by Christ crucified, taking in the mystery. St. Catherine de Ricci says to her sister, you'll find me at the cross in the open side of Christ. That's where you'll find me. And that led Catherine de Ricci to share in the passion of Christ, to cry out like Christ cried out from the cross in union with him. And so to go to the crucified one. Just to tie that into early monasticism, this is Isaac of Syria. And uh, so he brings kind of <laughs> the desert monasticism to a beautiful combination in like the seventh century. And he, he speaks about compunction of heart. Just let me share with you some of the, these passages. Um, and basically Isaac of Syria's way of entering into compunction of heart is by laying prostrate lying prostrate before Jesus Christ crucified, coming before Christ crucified with all your burdens, all your needs, all your frustration with yourself that you can't overcome this and that sin, that you're still kind of treating people uncharitably, bringing that all before the Lord, prostrate before the Lord and Jesus Christ crucified. So Isaac of Syria, this is from homily four, at whatever time God, and this is from his ascetical homilies, St. Isaac of Syria, at whatever time God should grant compunction to your heart from within, 
give yourself over to unremitting bows and prostrations. And when the demons try to persuade you to do something else, right, wouldn't your time be more effective doing this or that? Do not allow your heart to be concerned about any matter. And then behold and wonder at what is born within you from this. Right, compunction, contrition of heart is birth pains. It's bringing something to birth in you as that new heart is formed in you more completely. There is nothing greater and more laborious in ascetical struggles and nothing more excites envy in the demons than if a man prostrates himself before the cross of Christ, praying night and day. Then light will dawn within you and your righteousness will quickly shine forth and you will be like a paradise of blooming flowers in an unfailing fountain of waters. So this monastic compunction brings something to birth in you, a new life flowing of a fountain of waters, the gift of tears flowing from the heart, whether visible, physical tears or not. See what good things are born in a man from this struggle, the struggle of compunction. It often happens that when a man bends his knees in prayer and stretches forth his hands to the heavens, fixing his eyes upon the cross of Jesus and concentrating all his thoughts on God during his prayer, Beseeching God all the while with tears and compunction, suddenly and without warning, a fountain springs up in his heart, gushing forth sweetness. His, his members grow feeble. His eyesight is veiled. He bows his head to the earth, and his thoughts are altered because of the joy that surges throughout his entire being. So that's, um, let me just read a couple more passages. But this is what the monastic tradition is about in this compunction and, and the gift of tears. Uh, this is from uh, the appendix, additional homilies, number five. Um, I'm so, okay, so I'll, I'll end with that one. Okay, so this is uh, number appendix of homilies A, number seven. The things of God, it is said, come of themselves if the place is pure and undefiled. The words come of themselves mean that it is natural for purity and that the heavenly light shines in it without searching and labor on our part. Within a pure heart, the new heaven is stamped. The man who is clothed with the raiment of mourning is not only invincible to the allurements of the passions, but he is mighty and triumphant in the war against them. All right? So that place of mourning and compunction is also a fortress against temptation to overcoming translate tram, um, overcoming temptation. The man who is clothed with the raiment of mourning is not only invincible to the allurements of their passions, but he is mighty and triumphant in the war against them. Indeed, they, they do not venture at all to show themselves for battle, nor even to try their various devices from afar. Wherever there is mourning, that soul has made herself a house of lamentation and her manifold mournings for her sins. O man whose city is downtrodden by inner passions, take up the weapon of mourning and compunction. For this weapon is invincible and reliable on all occasions and is known from experience by men worthy of trust. So that's, you know, take Psalm 51, pray that over and over again, day after day before the crucified one. And you're in that fortress of humility, that fortress of compunction, a contrite heart, Page 50, 556, page 552, just one more, just five more lines here. This will be a clear sign for you of your soul's limpid purity, when after thoroughly examining yourself, you find that you are full of mercy for all mankind, and that your heart is afflicted by the intensity of your pity for men, and burns as with fire. By this, when it is continually present, the image of the Heavenly Father will be seen in you. So this is where compunction brings us. This is where mourning brings us. This is where the gift of tears uh, and a contrite heart brings us. To have compassion for all mankind, to be afflicted, to have your heart afflicted by the intensity of your pity for men and to burn with fire. When this is continually present, the image of the heavenly father will be seen in you. So isn't that just what we saw in St. Dominic, right? This ideal of early monasticism we see realized in St. Dominic in those passages we started with. 
Um, so just to kind of show, show that continuity with monasticism in the life of the St. Dominic. And so we need that kind of discipline, that monastic, that regular discipline in our own spiritual lives, day after day, whatever it looks like, our, our spiritual program of life. And to uh, approach the Lord with contrition of heart. And uh, here's, here's a way that I've kind of seen to kind of help this process al along. Uh, so let me share my screen again. And this just came, uh, I wrote this two, two days ago, probably. I was with the Missionaries of Charity in uh, Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania, and thinking about these themes. And um, I came, so this has came up as kind of my own personal program are things I need to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah, so how is it we get a new and living heart of flesh? Okay, for it, let reality affect your heart. Let reality affect your heart, right? We can tend to put on a protective shield to shield ourselves from sorrow, to shield ourselves from pain, to shield ourselves from vulner vulnerability, taking chances in love, uh, we want that protective shield around us, defense mechanisms. But no, to let reality affect your heart. And the people that the Lord brings into your life, uh, the people who, you know, ask you to pray for them, pray for me, you know, this uh, so-and-so in my family is falling away from the faith, so-and-so is struggling with cancer. And as they open up their heart to you, uh, let that affect your heart. And as part of God's plan, right? The kind of things you need to unite yourselves to, um, God's going to send people in your life. Like it, it all just fits together. You know, God's marvelous plan, this, this web of relationships. People come to you for prayer for this thing. And the Lord wants you to take it to heart. At the same time, he wants you to intercede for this person. He's also going to shape your heart through this. And he's going to send you the people. He's going to, and he's going to draw your heart to pray in a special way uh, for those things he's calling you to. And that's also going to also shape your own heart. Let reality affect your heart. I'm going to spend probably the most time on just the first one. Uh, and so, okay, so, but um, this is from Dietrich von Hildebrand. So he wrote a kind of a classic work uh, in the 1930s and 40s called Liturgy and Personality. And uh, he makes the point in there that, you know, what gets our heart right, what moves our heart is objective reality, right? You don't move your heart by like trying to force it to happen. You let the beautiful, you let the beauty of reality move your heart. You let an objective truth and goodness move your heart. So to have your heart moved, you have to take in objective reality. And uh, Dietrich von, uh, von Hildebrand notes that the liturgy is all about that. It puts before us objective reality, right? It doesn't make our experience the center or emotional emotion the center. Objective reality. God has accomplished our redemption. It, it's made present on the altar. And, and we conform to it. We take in the reality, and that shapes our heart. You know, there's a place for story here. There's a place for literature. There's a place for Terrence Malick <laughs> and movies that have deep mean, uh, deep meaning and themes or, you know, just about life. I mean, it doesn't have to be Terrence Malick, but Tree of Life is certainly a good one. Um, that um, stories are meant to move our heart and to take it in. And the beautiful is what uh, gives the soul wings. So that's an old kind of play, platonic principle. Uh, the heart grows wings through the beautiful by taking in the objective beautiful, and then your heart's moved. And so we want to let reality affect our heart in all these different ways. What kind of first kind of helpful, hopefully helpful uh, lesson here? Uh, number two, soak in the word of God to shape your heart. I've spoken a little bit about that. And, you know, praying the Psalter and the divine liturgy, the office, that's what's happening. Our heart is being shaped by soaking in the word of God, where we begin to echo what we read in the Psalms, 
where David's own heart, a man after God's own heart, is what scripture says about David. And so it's no mistake that God has David be the one who writes the Psalter, because he's a man after God's own heart. And so to, to take in these sentiments of David's heart, it's going to help us to be men and women after God's own heart. So the Psalms are key here, but all of scripture as well. So soak in the word of God, allow it to shape your heart through your continual reading and prayer and Lexio Divina and scripture memory and so forth. Uh, next, uh, our third or uh, another one, purify your heart through compunction. I've been speaking a lot about that. You know, Psalm 51, create in me, Lord, a clean heart and a steadfast spirit renew in me. Cast not your Holy Spirit from me. Purify your heart through compunction, contrition, confession, the sacrament of confession. Lit next one, live in your heart through prayer. Live in your heart through prayer. Find the place of the heart. I did a, a conference on the Jesus prayer in the Hezekast, the midday retreat with the mystics, all about finding that place of the heart and the depths of your soul. Live in your heart through prayer. I remember <laughs> uh, Father Francis Martin, who died in the odor of sanctity about five years ago. Um, he was teaching us a scripture class, and he said, uh, you were seminarians at, at that time. And Father Francis Martin says, you know, I hope in your confession class, they're teaching you that when you hear confessions, uh, to listen to the confessions from within your heart. So as you're hearing confessions, like enter into your heart and listen to the confessions from there. That deep listening. Um, and he says, I hope they're teaching you that in uh, your, your course on confession. Well, of course, they're not teaching that. <laughs> the course on confession, you know, teaching us, you know, the canon law and uh, theology, and, you know, getting practical to it as well. But no, only a person like Francis Martin is going to be able to share an insight like that with us. You know, surely Padre Pio also heard confessions from the place of the heart. And that's where he was able to understand the human heart as the penitents opened up their heart to him. So to enter into the heart and listen from there, to live in your heart, and prayer helps us to do that. Next one, enlarge your heart through intercession. All right, St. Paul says, widen your hearts to me. I've widened my heart to you. Hold other people in your heart as you intercede for them, as you pray for them. Right, our blessed mother. Her charity is so great that she holds all these sons and daughters of hers in her heart. And holding other people in our hearts helps expand our charity, helps us to enter into this. Enlarge your heart through intercession and then hold others in your heart in love. Reach out from your heart with compassion. Right? Compassion literally means suffering with. Enter into sympathy with others. Reach out from the depths of your heart to the pain of other people's hearts and have that heart reach uh, that my friend, Father Jesse Mango uh, likes as, as a theme, a heart reach, your heart reaching out to other hearts. Next one, groan from your heart in the spirit. Yeah, we have to get to that in St. Catherine, but Romans eight, those deep crying out from the heart that Romans eight speaks about. And ultimately it's a share in Jesus's own cry from his heart that Hebrews 5, 7 speaks about. Grown from your heart in the spirit. Yeah, there, there is a place for those groanings beyond all expression. The gift of tongues uh, comes in here as well. And you, you can sense in kind of the depths of the gift of tongues, uh, this um, intercession and deep solidarity with others and the sufferings of others, and, and the groanings of others. There's something like primordial about the, the groan. And so to, to groan from your heart and the spirit. You can't always give expression to it, and you have to give yourself the freedom to enter into that prayer um, beyond expression. Right? Don't be afraid to enter the, into that place just because you can't give words to the expressions of your heart. Uh, don't let that stop up 
those desires of the heart, the movements of the heart. Next one, draw forth from the depths of your heart, right? We have living water flowing up in our heart. Draw forth from that place of your heart as you're preparing talks, as you're trying to give people advice, as you're trying to say the right thing to your neighbor and love. Love people from that deep place of your heart. We don't want to be like superficial people. We want to be like Mother Teresa, who has th those deep eyes um, and that lives from the depths and draws forth from what we have in the depths, the indwelling trinity. Let living waters enliven your heart as a garden. That's the Holy Spirit's renewal in our hearts. Ezekiel 36, 24, and, and around there and onwards, I will give you a new heart. Put my law in you, breathe a new spirit in you, taking away your heart of stone, giving you a heart of flesh, allow the Holy Spirit to bring that reality about. Pray, ask the Holy Spirit to bring that reality about more and more. Hide yourself in the enclosure of Mary's heart. Mary's heart's like a cloister. There's a place for us in our heart. And it's a way of entering into a great selflessness. I'm going to pray from Mary's heart. I'm going to let go of all my own concerns. And I'm going to pray from the center of Mary's heart. She's going to enclose me in that enclosure of her heart. And praying from the center of Mary's heart is to pray from the center of the church, pleading for all people, pleading for the needs of Holy Mother Church. Behold the heart of Jesus pierced for love of you. Right, to come before the crucified one, to come before our Lord in the Eucharist and gaze upon uh, him dying on the cross, his heart pierced open for us, to enter into that place of the heart and to love uh, from there, receive Christ's love that you might love and return. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, I should bring things to a close here. So let me do that in, in two ways. Okay, so um, that place of the heart, we have to behold Jesus' own heart. We have to let the word of God uh, shape us. If you're taking notes, just um, jot down Catechism, um, paragraph 2562 through 64. It's all about the heart, what the Catechism has to say about the heart. Okay. Uh, yeah, Father, Father James <laughs> Brent. Anyways, it speaks about the importance of the practice of silence and recollection to find that place of the heart, to live from those depths, overcome superficiality by making time for silence and solitude. The Psalter shapes our desires. The distinctively performative language of the Psalms takes reader into various activities, recitation, movement, singing, complaining, proclaiming, entering, dwelling, and most broadly, worshiping. Undergirding all these activities, however, is a more fundamental operation at work, the shaping of desire. And the Psalms help to shape our desire. As a whole, the Psalms inculcate a desire for God. And then to consider here, St. Thomas Aquinas. This is from Catechism 112. And Aquinas notes, the catechism quotes him, the phrase heart of Christ can refer to sacred scripture. Right? We wouldn't have expected him to make that move. So we ponder, we behold the heart of Christ. We behold the heart of the pierced one by going before the crucifix, like St. Thomas does here in the stained glass window. But we also behold the heart of Christ in sacred scripture. How's that so? Well, the phrase heart of Christ can refer to sacred scripture, which makes known his heart. Right? Scripture makes known the heart of God. Closed before the passion, as the scripture was obscured, but the scripture has been open since the passion. Since those who from then on have understood it, consider and discern in what way the prophecies must be interpreted. So just like on the passion, the heart of Jesus is pierced open. So in the scriptures, we have the open heart of God. He manifests what's in his heart. He lets us enter into his heart through the word of God. 
So you, you gaze upon the crucifix, you take in the word of God, and you have an encounter with the heart of God in both ways. Okay, so this is um, a beautiful passage. This is what we'll end on. And I know I've jammed a lot in there. Um, but this is St. Catherine of Siena on the tears of fire, the weeping of desire. Um, and a good summary of the core of the reality we're about here. So uh, this is Dialogue 91 and 92. Uh, you know, with some passages deleted, just to make it a little more succinct. I guess God says, I have told you about perfect and imperfect tears and how they can all come from the heart. So, you know, perfect tears was at stage three. There's a lot of self and even self-pity, uh, but also your heart's moved um, more in an emotional way. It hasn't gone as deep and consistent as perfect love. Um, I have told you about perfect and imperfect tears and how they all come from the heart. Whatever their reason, they all come from the same vessel. And so all of them can be called heartfelt tears. The only difference lies in whether the love is ordered well or ill, is perfect or imperfect. All right, so what do you weep over? What, what moves your heart? What do you grieve over? And do you grieve uh, just for yourself in self-pity? Or are you, are you, is your heart moved for others as well? I still have to tell you, if I would fully answer your desire about some souls who want the perfection of tears, though it seems they cannot have it. Is there another way than physical tears? And God says, yes, there is a weeping of fire, of true holy longing, and it consumes in love. Such a soul would like to dissolve her very life in weeping and tears, you know, literal tears and self-contempt and for the salvation of souls, but she sees, seems unable to do it. I tell you, these souls have, you know, tears of fire. And here's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit weeping in us. In this fire, the Holy Spirit weeps in my presence for them. So again, remember, this is God the Father speaking. As Catherine hears him. In this fire, the Holy Spirit weeps in my presence for them and for their neighbors. I mean that my divine charity sets ablaze with its flame the soul who offers me her restless longing without any physical tears. So the tears don't have to be there. These, I tell you, are tears of fire. And this is how the Holy Spirit weeps. All right, that's a strong, that's a strong phrase. Taken from Romans 8. The Holy Spirit groans and he weeps and through us. Since the soul cannot do it with literal tears, she offers her desire to weep for love of me. And if you open your mind's eye, you will see that the Holy Spirit weeps in the person of every one of my servants who offers me the fragrance of holy desire and constant humble prayer. This, it seems, is what the glorious apostle Paul meant when he said that the Holy Spirit weeps before me, the Father, with unspeakable groaning for you. So that's a Romans 8 passage. You know, consider here too, the third beatitude, it's different in different account. The third beatitude, uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, that word comfort there is paracletes. Paracletes is from the same root as paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So more literally, the third beatitude is blessed, or the second beatitude. I forget which one. Um, anyway, the Latin fathers switch it, but I forget what the, the Greek text says. Um, <clears throat> blessed are those who mourn, for they will be paracleted. If you wanted to give that a literal, right, Holy Spirit, paraclete, you can translate comforter, consoler. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be paracleted. So even in the second beatitude, the beatitude of mourning, we see the relationship to the Holy Spirit that St. Paul picks up on in Romans 8. You see, you see the connection there? Um, France, Father Francis Martin pointed out um, to us that that second beatitude about mourning is really a mystery of intercession. Blessed are those who mourn as they intercede for others, as they show compassion for others, as they're in sympathy with others, uh, for they will be paracleted. Their groaning will be the Holy Spirit groaning to them. Their mourning will be the Holy Spirit crying out with cries beyond all utterance. 
their love will be deepened. Right? That's an expression of love. The fourth perfection of tears combined with the fifth perfection of tears, joy in the Lord, happiness in God. The two can be intertwined. So, um, okay, so second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be paracleted, Romans 8, touching on that same mystery and reality. Let's continue with St. Catherine here. So you see the fruit of these tears of fire is no less than that of physical tears of water. In fact, it is often more depending on the measure of the soul's love. Such a soul should not be confounded then, nor think she has lost me because she longs for tears and cannot have them in the way she wishes. She should rather want them in harmony with my will, bowing humbly to yes or no, whichever pleases my divine goodness. Sometimes I prefer not to grant her physical tears in order to make her stand constant in my presence, humbled and tasting me in continual prayer and longing. Right, that's another deeper core expression of the gift of tears, continual humble prayer and longing. Think of Dialogue 63, which we spoke about a couple of months ago, locking yourself up in your inner cell like the apostles in the upper room with that humble, constant prayer and longing, even when you don't feel consolation. That's that place of groaning. That's that place of the gift of tears in the deeper sense, the tears of fire. I prefer sometimes not to grant her physical tears in order to make her stand constant in my presence, humbled and tasting me in continual prayer and longing. For if she had what she was asking for, it would not be as profitable to her as she thinks. Instead, I give her spiritual tears, tears of the heart, tears of the heart. That's another beautiful phrase, full of the fire of my divine charity. Right, so that's at the heart of it, right? These spiritual tears, tears of the heart, full of the fire of my divine charity. <laughs> let, let, me, let me linger just a moment longer on, um, okay, sometimes I prefer not to grant her physical tears in order, to, in order to make her stand constant in my presence, humbled and tasting me in continual prayer and longing. So that continual prayer, that dryness, that emptiness for the Lord, that crying out, that thirst for the Lord is also a place of those tears. So think of Mother Teresa here. Think of Mother Teresa here and her thirst for God and her constant longing for the Lord uh, day in and day out. Um, that that too is an expression of this gift of tears in the deepest way. Um, so here's here's a quotation that has really kind of captured my heart again, like two days ago. This all kind of came together. Uh, so this is from the Thin Red Line. Uh, as you might know, Terrence Malick. Okay, okay you know he he pulls my heartstrings. He uh, he helps me to enter this place of the heart on kind of the the human level. You know that can be graced, anointed, drive you deeper. So he of course did a movie called The Thin Red Line uh, about World War II. Um, and but it's based on a novel and based on an earlier movie called The Thin Red Line as well. Uh, the, the novel is uh, written by James Jones. And he has a beautiful line, James Jones, the author. So this is probably written in the 50s or 60s, maybe a little later. Um, and James Jones himself was one of the soldiers in uh, the Second World War. And uh, just witness like the trial that war uh, brings to the soldier and the trial of faith and how different soldiers, you know, just battled with this trial of, of, of faith um, through, through war. Um, <clears throat> and so um, a line, beautiful line from the novel that also gets in Terrence Malick's uh, version of the Thin Red Line. So you can catch some of these on YouTube, clips of them. I, I recommend just watching the original just because the way he does it is just masterful. And yeah, this is, you know, movies can help us <laughs> move our hearts, you know, good uh, kind of noble, uh, lofty movies um, that have kind of a deep theme, a noble theme even, or just a noble theme uh, can move our hearts. Um, but, okay, so the, the line is, so this is a soldier battling with, with faith. And this is Sean Penn and Terrence Malick's version. It comes from his lips. 
And so um, Jim Caviezel, you know, the, the act, actor who had played, played Jesus in The Passion of Christ, he's kind of the main actor, the, the soldier who is kind of the Christ figure um, and is in tune with God and with God's heart. And uh, Brad, so his name is Wit. And then his sergeant is Sergeant, uh, I forget the, the name, uh, but it's Brad Pitt. Oh, no, it's not Brad Pitt. It's, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry. It's not Brad Pitt. It's, uh, he's also in the movie, I think, but no. no. <laughs> uh, Welsh, Welsh, Sean Penn, Sean Penn, Sean Penn, play Sergeant Welsh. And Sergeant Welsh is kind of the hardened soldier. Um, <clears throat> and he's, he's kind of close to belief in God, but um, wit is working on him. And so at some point, as kind of a silent monologue, uh, you hear the thoughts in uh, Sergeant um, Welsh's heart uh, speaking to God. If I never meet you in this life, let me fill the lack. If I never meet you in this life, let me fill the lack. Right. So he doesn't want a heart that's numb. He doesn't want a heart that's dead. Right. Many people in our world today. They don't meet the Lord and they don't feel the lack. That's not a good place to be. Uh, people fill their minds with distractions to not feel the lack. Uh, but we do want to feel the lack of God in this life. And in this life, because it's a life of faith, there's always going to be something of that lack. We don't see God face to face. You know, John of the Cross, Spiritual Canticle, the first 12 stanzas are all about longing for the lord where are you where have you hidden and left me moaning you fled like the stag after wounding me i went out calling you but you were gone All right that's the experience of, of faith the hidden god we never fully meet him and it's good to feel the lack of that and mother Teresa, experiencing that thirst for the lord through her later years even when she's so intimate with the lord uh, she shows us that it's precisely experiencing the lack, let me feel the lack, that itself is meeting the Lord, right? If I never meet you in this life, let me feel the lack. And to feel the lack is itself actually uh, to meet him. We learn that from Mother Teresa's thirst. She met the Lord in that thirst, in that longing, in that fire of love, in those tears of the heart, those spiritual tears of the heart. She met the Lord in the longing for the Lord. So it, it is a profound phrase. Yeah, Lord, if I, if I never meet you or I never find you in this life, let me fill the lack. Fill my heart with that longing. That too is an encounter with you. That too is a meeting with you, a painful meeting, but I want that. I don't want to be dull. I don't want to have a dead heart. I don't want to have a distracted heart. And so here's the full line. If I never meet you in this life, let me feel the lack. One glance from your eyes and my life will be yours. All right, it doesn't take much from the Lord. A semi glimpse of the Lord, one glance from his eyes and our life belongs to him. We give ourselves over completely to him. He's so beautiful. He's so lovely. It just takes a glance from his eyes and he wins our hearts and we belong to him for the rest of our lives. And even if the rest of the, our lives is that thirst, painful longing, if we're feeling the lack, it just takes that one glimpse from his eyes to capture us. If I never meet you in this life, let me feel the lack. One glance from your eyes and my life will be yours. Whew. Okay. We're, we are, you know, two more minutes. Come on. <clears throat> for if she had what she was asking for, it would not be as profitable to her as she thinks. Instead, I give her spiritual tears, tears of the heart, full of the fire, my divine charity. This is the truth about the five stages of tears, which I, eternal truth, have explained to you. Um, My sweetest daughter, drown yourself then in the blood of Christ crucified, the humble, tormented, spotless lamb, my only begotten son. Keep growing in virtue so that the fire of my divine charity may be fed within you. The five stages I have spoken of are like five great channels 
four of them, so you know, not the, the first stage of the worldly sorrow. The other four of them flow freely with an infinite variety of tears that are life-giving if they are used virtuously. How are they infinite? I'm not saying that in this life you should weep infinitely much. I call them infinite because of the soul's infinite desire. I have told you how tears well up from the heart. The heart gathers them up from its burning desire and holds them out to the eyes. Thus are fire and tears made one in burning desire. And because desire has no end, it cannot be satisfied in this life. Rather, the more it loves, the less it seems to itself to love. So love exerts a holy longing, and with that longing, the eyes weep. All right, so let's, uh, let's close in prayer, and then we'll, I'll look at the questions in the chat box. We can... I want to go a little more. If I never meet you, Lord, in this life, let me feel the lack. One glance from your eyes and my life will be yours. Lord, we ask you to, to captivate us, Lord, with that one glance from your eyes, with that uh, little glimpse of yourself. Capture our hearts, Lord. And let us not shield our hearts, Lord, from your heart work, from what you want to accomplish in our hearts. Let us allow our hearts to be a place in the furnace, to be sensitive hearts, uh, to be hearts that want to be more in union with the heart of Jesus Christ crucified, with the heart of our compassionate mother, Mary at the foot of the cross, with the heart of St. Catherine, with the heart of St. Dominic, and all these great Dominican saints and other saints throughout the ages. Uh, give us a heart, Lord, that beats in accord with your heart. Give us deep hearts, Lord. Give us hearts uh, filled deep with your love. And we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, a little Q&A. Um, but I, I did want to mention, <laughs> just really briefly, um, uh, I can't find it now, no? I can't find it. So St. Catherine, she does have an interesting phrase about listening with the ears of the heart. And so this kind of corresponds to like what Father Francis Martin says, you know, when you hear confessions or when you listen in sympathy to somebody, listen from your heart, listen from the depths of your heart. Um, so she says in... Anyways, I'll, I'll just try to summarize. I can't find it now, but she does say, I think it's like dialogue 58. She says, listen with the ears of your heart. Right, so to listen to others with the ears of our heart, to, to listen to the word of God, to take in the word of God with the tears of our hearts, uh, to listen to reality with the ears of our hearts. And then uh, a little bit later, yeah, okay, here it is. Whew. Okay, thank you. This is dialogue uh, 86 and dialogue 98. She says, now, or God says, now I eternal truth have let you see with your mind's eye and hear with your feelings ear. How you much must behave. So to hear with your feelings ear, to hear with the affection of your heart, to, to hear with the movement of your heart and, and compassion. And then in Dialogue 98, she says, open the sensitive ear of your desire. My kind of mysterious words here, but I, I think they do, they, they describe something experiential in a way that's hard to capture. Open the sensitive ear of your desire. And there's a way in which our love hears, our heart hears, our desire for the Lord, we can open an ear there to receive from the Lord. 
and our compassion for others. We can listen in that place of compassion, that place of movement of love for the person. Listen there in that place in the heart. And that opens you up to reality. That helps you to live from the depths. Open the sensitive ear of your desire. Hear with your feelings ear. So that's where Catherine lived and where she heard and where she spoke from. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get to the questions here. Uh, how do we reconcile the longing for God while at the same time the awareness and understanding that God is completely with us uh, all the time? Yep, good. Good question, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can talk a lot about this. Um, we, we touched on this last class a month ago where we talked about graces of contemplative prayer and that St. Catherine gives an account of it. Um, and I laid out there using John of the Cross, three modes of God's presence. Excuse me. Um, so there are three modes of God's presence. God is present everywhere by essence, presence, and power. You know, he's present. He's present even in the stone by holding it in existence. So St. Thomas says that in question eight, the first part of the Summa, Summa, that God is everywhere by presence, power, and essence, by essence, by holding things in existence. Right, that point of contact with God as he holds something in existence is the way he's present. That holds true for everything. Uh, he's present by, he's everywhere by presence, and that's his, his inner, his um, gaze pierces everything. You know, we're present, be present to me, pay attention. Well, God is always present to us. His inner, his gaze pierces our heart. He's everywhere in that way as well, by presence. He's everywhere by power. His power extends to everything. It can, you know, come into action whenever. So that's the first mode of God's presence, and that applies to everything. He's everywhere in that way. The second mode of God's presence is by grace. Be someone who's in a state of grace. So God is always, you know, as long as the person stays in the state of grace, God is always in the soul as in a temple. Through the state of grace. And then the third mode of God's presence is by spiritual affection by the stirring up of charity in our heart, by the sense of God's presence, by uh, the manifestation of God in contemplative prayer. You're brought into awestruck wonder before God's maj majesty, his presence overwhelms you. That's that third mode of presence. And that comes and goes. And so the spiritual writers use Song of Songs a lot to talk about that coming and going. The bridegroom comes and goes. St. Bernard uses that language all the time. And he's speaking about that third mode of presence. He recognizes that God is, is always present uh, in the state who's in the soul of grace. There's something stable about the presence. But there is a sense in which we feel his presence more at times than others. And he visits the soul. And so uh, St. Bernard talks a lot about that. He doesn't give such a systematic account of it. Uh, but John of the Cross comes in and helps us with that. Uh, Spiritual Canticle 11. And so it helps us to understand uh, the rest of the tradition. And what St. John of the Cross describes as um, that third, you wouldn't call it mystical presence, uh, contemplative prayer presence, uh, affective presence, charity being stirred. St. Bernard speaks about the, the pot of water being placed on top of the flame and that the water boils up. You know, so sometimes when the Lord comes, uh, our, our soul becomes alive. Our soul uh, boils up like boiling water. Um, and so John the Cross describes that as that spiritual affection. And then St. Catherine gives a good the description of it. Uh, the end of section 78 of the dialogue. This is page 147. And she says, so God the Father says, I call it a lover's game. So in the Middle Ages, that was a common way to talk about this coming and going of the bridegroom. He's near and far, and it's a game of love. St. Therese picks this language up again. You know, God, we're, we're God's little plaything. Sometimes he, he casts us far away. We feel far from him, but we're still his beloved uh, plaything. He still loves us. And sometimes he holds us close to his heart. And it's love that motivates both this game of love. And so St. Catherine uses this, that language, and the medieval women mystics love that, talking about the game of love, Mechtaud of Magburg and others in St. Catherine's in that tradition. 
So God says, I call it a lover's game because I go away for love and I come back for love. No, not really I, for I am your unchanging and unchangeable God. What goes and comes back is the filling my charity creates in the soul. What comes and goes back is the filling my charity creates in the soul. And that sounds very much like what John the Cross says, that third mode of presence. The third is his presence by spiritual affection, by which God refreshes, delights, and gladdens the soul. So that's, um, so that's part of this, this coming and going. And when the Lord goes, it's like what John cries out, where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. There's that longing when he departs. Um, and so <clears throat> why does this happen? Well, because God is the hidden God. In this life, we live by faith. A God doesn't manifest himself completely until the next life, face-to-face -face vision. And so St. John on the cross notes that, I mean, there are semi-glimpses we catch of God. We do catch a glimpse of his majesty, his love, who he is and himself beyond what our, you know, we can come to on our concepts alone, our own conceptual work. He takes us beyond that in a infused contemplation at times, visits of the Lord, which are common. For those um, you know, who apply themselves to prayer, it's common. Uh, and so, but so John of the Cross says, even the most like manifest <laughs> grace of prayer given in this life, it still happens in hiddenness. John of the Cross says that. And so there, there's a woundedness, there, there's a longing for that full manifestation for God. It's, it's always in hiddenness. It's always the not yet that we're yearning for. And so uh, John of the Cross and also in Spiritual Canticle 7 talks about the wound of love. We catch a glimpse of God and our hearts are stirred up for more and we long for more. And John of the Cross says there are three levels of the wounds of love. This is Spiritual Canticle 7. First level, created things. Right? So you see the beautiful sunset and there's that longing, <laughs> that ache that's in your heart for God for the creator of, of the sun, for the beauty that the sun uh, reflects, uh, the transcendent beauty. There's an ache in your heart. And John the Cross calls that the wound of love. Your desire has been stirred up and there's a wound of love because of that. And that's the, uh, that's the first level. Created things do that. The second level are things of, of faith, the articles of faith, reading scripture, um, you know, meditating on the passion of Christ. Uh, and that stirs up our heart, too, and gives us a glimpse of God, his love. And that, too, leaves us with the wound of love. We know more, and so we pine for more as we get to know the Lord through the scriptures, through the articles of faith. Um, and then John Cross speaks about uh, the third level of wound of love, or the third category of wound of love. And that comes from touches of God. That comes from graces and prayer. That comes from infused contemplation. That comes from visits of the Lord. Like St. Catherine talks about, we spent all of last month, or last month, the, the conference, the whole time talking about those. Um, that when the Lord visits, and it, you know, it's common for those of us um, committed to the life of prayer. When the Lord comes and visits us, there's a glimpse of him. There's a more of him that, that we experience that. And that leaves us pining for more because it's not a full manifestation. And we too then cry out with John on the cross, where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounded me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. So we cry out, we, we say that, we cry that out in our, our hearts, even as we recognize that there's a stable presence of God. He's with me in the darkness. And our faith lays hold of that, even when we just fill a block when God hems in our prayer, like the book of Lamentation says, he's like, hems, he like builds a wall between us and himself. Our prayer like can't reach him, it feels like. Lamentation gives a good uh, expression of that. Uh, we're in that place, but when we're in that place and we're crying out, where have you hidden? Uh, we still make that act of faith that he is present. And it's kind of the, the desolating presence of the Lord, uh, the dark presence of the Lord, the bright darkness of, of the Lord. 
Um, and so, yeah, the, both are kind of at play here. And so it's good, uh, Sarah, that you kind of brought up that dynamic for us to, to consider. And that's a little bit of um, how, to, how I open it up for you. Spiritual Canticle 1 and John the Cross, you get a good description of both those sentiments. The first half, uh, Spiritual Canticle 1, his commentary, paragraphs or sections 1 through 12 are about seeking God by pure faith when he doesn't seem to be present. Um, but then after that, the second part of that Spiritual Canticle 1 canticle, um, around paragraph 15 or so, section 15, and a, a couple of sections uh, following that as well. He does talk about visits of the Lord then. The Lord visits the soul and gives us glimpses of him, uh, wounds us with love. Um, and uh, that's part of the spiritual life as well and part of the, the, the dynamic. Uh, so yeah, so there, it, it's both. It's both that stable presence of God that, that's always with us and that we apprehend by faith alone. Um, even in the darkness, uh, then also visits of the Lord. The Lord does show his face to us at times. He gives us a glimpse at times. He visits the soul. And visits are key for Catherine of Siena, as we saw last month. Okay, so Catherine, all right. Uh, this is like the rule of St. Benedict. Yeah, right. Yep, awesome. Thank you. No, thanks for bringing that up. Listen with the ear of your heart. Listen with the ear of your heart. Um, this is This is important. This is key. Um, listening, when we use that language, listen with the ear of your heart, it does mean, you know, hear the scriptures from that place of the heart. Hear, you know, good anointed preaching in that place of the heart. Uh, be open to reality. Hear reality in all its different forms, the events of life, whatever. Hear reality from that place of the heart. All that's entailed in listening with the ear of your heart. Uh, but there's there's also a, another level of this, <clears throat> and you, you find the same teaching here in both John of the Cross and in St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and, and others as well, but I can show you passages and those two uh, uh, authors, saints. <clears throat> but the idea is, so John of the Cross puts it most clearly and succinctly, uh, living flame, uh, number one, his commentary on the first stanza. I, I don't know, paragraph 13 kind of sticks out my, somewhere in that first uh, chapter, he says, for God to speak is, is for him to act in the soul. God's speech is the effect he produces in the soul. God's speech is the effect he produces in the soul. And these effects that God produces in the soul can be stirring up our charity, stirring up our desire. Father Haggerty, Father Haggerty, <clears throat> Father Donald Haggerty and his contemplative hunger has some beautiful passages about that. One way that we speak to the Lord is on the level of desire. God stirs up our desire and that's him speaking to us. And then we respond not so much with words, but with our desire. Desire of gratitude, of praise of him, thanks for him, love of him. And so that there, so the speech, the back and forth, the communication with God, which is a two-way street, is a two-way street. Um, that's referred to as him speaking to us. And his speech is the effect he produces in the soul. So this is another way of understanding that. Listen with the ear of your heart. Receive the effect he produces in your soul. Uh, receive that into your heart. Listen to, with the ear of your heart and then speak with your heart. St. Bernard says that the effectus has its own language. The effectus, uh, the Latin word, is a rich term for St. Bernard. Effectus, you know, we get the word affection from it. it means desire, it means longing, it means inclination. It, it's, it's, a, it's a rich word for St. Bernard. It's, it's hard to translate. But St. Bernard says the effectus has its own language. Uh, that back and forth between God and us, that heart to heart with the God, with God, can, it happens in silence even. <clears throat> they speak by silences. Now, the effect who has its own language, and so listen with the ear of your heart also can apply on, on, that, on that level. Blessed Conchita, uh, who would receive locutions from the Lord, there was a time where she went a long time without hearing the Lord in that way, so she starts complaining to the Lord, where are you? And the Lord, uh, she feels, says in the depths of her heart, I, I'm the word. I always speak. 
I cannot but speak on the word, but I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. So to listen with the ear of our heart is to be open to all those ways that Jesus, the Son, the Word, that God has to vibrate in our souls. I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. And to listen with the heart, the ear of the heart, is to be open to those. Okay. Okay. Anything else here? Well, time flies when you're having fun, huh? You know, John 17, let me just end there. This with this hearing with the ears of the heart. And um, yeah, this is about having a heart after God's own heart. So David, a man after God's heart, helps us to get there. The Psalms help us to get there. The prophets help us to get there. You know, those long passages of, of Isaiah. Jeremiah's pleading and lamentations gives us a heart after his own heart. Um that heart that does have that gift of tears in the depths, spiritual tears, tears of the heart. Um, um, and, you know, the gospel of the New Testament as well, the last discourse as well, of course, in a powerful way, gets us to that place of the heart. And we, we get in the last discourse uh, that the words that God speak to us are among the most precious treasures that he gives us. You can find in the church fathers in origin you know, have the, the same reverence you have for the word, for every um, word, every verse of the word that you have for, for, for the Eucharist. Um, you don't let a, a crumb fall away in, in the Eucharist because it's Christ's true body, blessed soul, and divinity. Um, and so don't let a crumb of the scriptures uh, get by you. Now, you know, there's some exaggeration there. Um, we don't like genuflect before <clears throat> the scriptures. Uh, but we, we can get his point uh, that, yeah, the words of God are precious. And so uh, Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, but I, I call you friends. Because all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. All that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. That's, that's how you've entered into my friendship. That's what it means for you to be my friend, to speak these words to you, these words of love. And how's that the case? Um, well, it's because they come from God's heart. Because so in John 17, it comes back again. I have given them your word, and the world hated them because they don't belong to the world. I've given them your word, Father, and they've, they, they believe that you sent me. Um, and those who believe through their word, you know, enter into the same relationship. And so the words of scripture, they're, they're coming from God's heart. It's that heart speaks to heart. And God opens up his heart to us uh, through the word of God. And he allows our hearts to be, to take uh, what's in his heart into our hearts. The interiority of God enters into our interiority through the word. Just as I like preach to you words, my interiority, I'm sharing what's interior to me with you through words. You can let those words enter your interiority and, and create we can be united in our interiorities through the word through the word spoken from my heart to your heart it's really kind of insane but all that is built on that more primary word of of that the father speaks from his heart right our language is mirrored after that most primal utterance the father uttering his word uh, John 1.18, the only son, the word, who is in the bosom of the father, he has made him known. The word comes from the father's heart into our hearts. The, God, God opens up his interiority, speaks the word, and his interiority can enter into our interiority. We're no longer slaves, but we're friends, because all that he's heard from the father, he's made known to us. And so to let the words of scripture um, shape us like that, and then we're brought in to have a, a heart after God's own heart, a heart like God's heart, a heart of the compassionate Father. Okay, so uh, so that's it for now. Um, so next week it's going to be uh, pages one seventy five to two hundred, 
and we'll pick up some of the themes we kind of let pass in um, some of these readings and then uh, press on into uh, the chapter on the truth. So uh, God bless you all. Now let's continue to pray for one another you know, that we uh, enter into this mysterious reality of intercession like hearts attuned to God and his plan for us and for the world. Good night. God bless.